This podcast is brought to you by Aspiration. At Aspiration, their investment strategies are built for the middle class. Signing up takes as little as $500 in five minutes of your time. You can sign up and find out more information at aspiration.com slash smart people. Past performance is not indicative of future returns. There is no guarantee that any investment product will achieve its objectives, generate profits, or avoid losses. Investing involves risk of loss, and alternative investments may not be suitable for everyone. Before investing, consider your investment objectives. The podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest, I don't understand that. As a man, I I don't get it. Welcome to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. I'm Chris Stemp and thank you for joining us for another informational yet enjoyable conversation. I really enjoyed our guest this week. I don't know, some people you just connect with and it seems like the conversation flows so easily. And that's how it felt this week. And on top of that, our subject is one that is very near and dear to my heart, as I'm sure it is for many of you out there. Let's get on with it. This week, we are talking with Lee Gallagher. Now, it's interesting because Lee is an assistant managing editor at Fortune Magazine, where she edits feature stories on a variety of subjects, oversees Fortune franchises, including the magazine's 40 under 40 rankings, and writes the Urbanist column on Fortune.com. So as an assistant managing editor at Fortune, she's one of the highest, I don't know, ranking folks in the media industry, right? We spend the first part of the episode talking about what that is, right? Like new media versus old media, and how do you shift if you're Fortune magazine into being a print publication to being online and on YouTube and on video and all the crazy places they are. Then in the second half, we transition to really how we were put in touch with Lee. We talk about her book and her book is called The End of the Suburbs, Where the American Dream is Moving. And I just found it so fascinating. As I state in the interview, I recently moved from the city to the suburbs. I personally love them. I also think about where I grew up and my kind of idyllic, small town, middle class at best upbringing, where I knew kids all across the neighborhood, not just my street, but streets and streets and streets of children. And we would run around and play and get in trouble and get hurt and play in the woods and get dirty and shoot BB guns and throw acorns at each other. And, And that is just what I believe the suburbs were. But there's no denying that for the most part, those things have changed. And when you wonder why, right, you see it. Why do kids not really play in the streets as much, but they have to be in uh, organized sports? Or why do they just seem more barren, these suburbs? Well, Lee goes on to talk about it in the book. We do talk about it in this episode. It was really enjoyable talking to Lee. She's super bright. Not only is she the assistant managing editor at Fortune, But she's also the co-chair of the Fortune Most Powerful Women's Summit. She speaks regularly at Fortune and other business and economic conferences and is a seasoned business news commentator, appearing regularly on MSNBC's Morning Joe, CBS News, CNBC, and she's in charge of the online series Fortune Live, which you can find at fortune.com slash fortune live. Just wanted to say, if you like the show, sign up for the newsletter. We are at smartpeoplepodcast.com. We love to connect with you. And leave a rating and review on iTunes if you wouldn't mind. We really appreciate it. Here it is, our interview with Lee Gallagher. Let's dive right into what you do. You basically, I mean, you don't have to be modest. You pretty much run Fortune magazine. (laughs) I mean, come on. Oh, I'm not being modest to say that that's not, you know, I wouldn't say I run Fortune. But um, we, uh, I'm I'm an assistant managing editor at Fortune, which means I'm one of the top editors here. And, um, you know, the role of magazine editor has changed a lot over the years as the 
industry has changed and my role has changed tremendously uh, along with that. So whereas I used to spend most of my time editing, um, I now spend it doing all sorts of things, running conferences. We have a lot of live events these days. I, I work on our Most Powerful Women kind of enterprise, which is a lot of live events and building a kind of community there. I host a show on fortune.com called Fortune Live, which is a very new thing and, and a lot of fun. And um, I do edit and write features as well. So it's it's a little bit of everything, which is really exciting and fun. So let's talk about the reason that all of this has changed, because I think it's obviously a key topic, talking to someone uh, who, who works for and basically runs a such a powerful magazine such as Fortune that's now turned into an entire brand. Has the industry changed or has your job changed because of strictly profitability? Is it, hey, we need to find new new ways to create revenue, so you're going to have to not only edit the printed word, but also do these conferences and TV shows and blogs, vlogs, YouTubes, all that? You know, I think it's actually more because the technology's changed and the way people consume content has changed. So, uh, you know, for example doing, you know, this digital video show. I mean, we, we, there are more and more places and platforms you can be to reach your readers and your viewers. And in this day and age where there is so much content flowing at people all the time, you really need to be everywhere. So it's about, you know, really going into new frontiers where the, where the viewer or reader is. So the video we're doing is one example of that. Certainly we've launched, you know, our online uh, footprint, fortune.com has greatly expanded in just the past uh, eight months or a year. And, you know, we're reinventing ourselves to really meet the the needs of a digital uh, viewership, which, you know, everybody is, is doing these days. So that's one reason why the role has shifted. But it's funny. I mean, some of the things I do that that are so different from traditional, you know, print editing really emerged more organically. And I think our most powerful women's Summit and Franchise is a great example of that. About 17 years ago, my colleague Patty Sellers started a, a list in the magazine and a conference for women in business, which at the time, the conference was 10 women around a table. Um, and it's grown to become 400 women, a very, very um, prestigious gathering, invitation only. We have a wait list of hundreds of people waiting for the right to pay a very high ticket price to come and gather. And I think the importance of that has grown over the years as people become more and more interested in these opportunities to engage, um, you know, physically on site, really connect. And that's why we've se- we're seeing so many conferences now. Everyone's starting a conference mm-hmm. in some way or another. So uh, that started a long time ago, and it was really more driven by what we thought was a story, you know, women are doing a lot more in business now. Let's do something around that. And that was, that was, you know, in, in retrospect, that was very prescient because um, that's sort of where the business moved. And so um, it's a combination of the new technologies plus the just new ideas and new ways to, to reach people and connect with people. And, um, you know, yeah, we're looking for new ways to profit as well. I mean, that's, you know, that's, we have to find ways to make all this stuff um, pay the bills and thrive and, 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 you know, maybe shift our models from publishing companies that made money one way from advertisements and magazines to uh, media companies that make, com- make money all kinds of ways. Do you know what is the most profitable division of Fortune right now? Is it still advertising in magazines or you has know, that I changed? No, exactly. And if I did, I pr- they would probably, probably couldn't tell if me I, if I said so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But um, definitely, you know, a lot of our parts of our businesses are really strong. Our conferences are very strong. And mm. I think the conference business in general is very strong. It's why a lot of people are entering it now. And, um, you know, we like to think that we have had this um, really strong and quite long track record, really perfecting how you put on a conference, how you stage it, how you how you do it. It's not so easy. It's not something that anybody can just jump into and, and start, uh, as I think people find. But um but but that that helps. Yeah. So as an editor and given I know that can mean a lot of things and perhaps we'll get a chance to dive in exactly what it does mean. But one of your jobs is really to hold up the sanctity of journalism, right, to to report on and to make sure the stories that get printed are uh, true and important and uh, interesting and all those things. 
How do you feel about this massive influx of information and that the sources aren't always vetted? And so, you know, say these these big institutions or these more respected magazines such as yours, they are fighting off or trying to get spotlight from oftentimes misrepresented uh, smaller individuals or whatever it might be. You know, is that a struggle to still try to tell the same good stories and get into people's attentions? Well, you know, it's it's totally true. The landscape has changed so much. There are just, um, you know, millions of pieces of content out there all the time that you're competing with. And, um, you know, it's true. The, the role of the editor is to, uh, you know, the buck really stops with the editor. I mean, I, I edit stories and I help writers, um, you know, determine what the story is and shape the stories after they're in and all that stuff. But, you know, the editor is also the person that... Um, really is is supposed to raise um you know question the writer when needed so okay you're saying something about this person did you did you call and actually let let the person know you're saying that i mean there's all sorts of ethical things that you have to do in journalism and most people know but you know the editor is sort of there to kind of manage over all of that and i do think with um the proliferation of so many online the online world where really anybody can can publish anything not every enterprise has a writer and an editor working in pairs to put out a piece of, of, of journalism work. I mean, that's not really how it works so much on the internet. It does in many places, but certainly not everywhere. And I think that that, uh, you know, it's, it's not a great thing, but at the same time, I think that, um, really great pieces that kind of rise to the top organically online. And that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of the wisdom of the crowd. You know, if there's a really great piece out there, um, it'll get shared and talked about, and, and that becomes much more obvious mm-hmm. in today's online world. And at the same time, if there is something that was done in not a great way, um, somebody said something that was wrong or said something that was maybe irresponsible, I mean, th- there, there's a lot of checks and balances out there now. So you, you can't, um, you know, that that will also become exposed. So I think there's a sort of, you know, it's a democratic process. And, um, you know, I, I do think that the more that there there is out there, the more people, readers really want to know they're reading something quality and uh, something fresh and original. And um, it's pretty easy to, to, to know what people are talking about and go to those those kinds of stories. Yeah, I was just thinking about like the the democratization of media and how actually that in a lot of ways is a great thing and it keeps people honest whereas opposed to in the past just a few large media corporations held so much pull in the world's decision making that that also can can deliver its own problems absolutely and you know uh, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there i mean anybody you know people can that maybe don't work within the confines of a huge media organization can write something really smart or write a couple pieces that they get a lot of attention and then, you know, they become discovered and then maybe they, maybe one of the big media enterprises hires them. I mean, it's, you know, these two worlds aren't, don't have to be totally separate. It's a, it's a, it's become a lot easier to find and spot talent as well. So again, as an editor, and I'm kind of presuming this, but your job is probably to make sure that things get read. I mean, you can put out great stuff, but if the titles aren't catchy or it doesn't flow right or all those things and people don't read them, then you're not doing your job. So how do you feel about all of the the clickbait that's out there? You know, the headline manipulation and because you, you mentioned the word attention and it is such a scarce resource these days. And for a media organization, you have to have it. So have you found yourself becoming any more kind of disenfranchised with this this whole just the human attention and how it operates and how to get it? And maybe you have to manipulate it, you know, um, Yes. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the thing about everything being so transparent. It's very clear what, you know, the American public likes, you know, I mean, they like the Kardashians, they like certain kinds of headlines. Um, But I really think it's possible to deliver a great headline that will be uh, clicky and buzzy and get a lot of traffic on a story that is a really worthwhile piece of journalism, whether it's about the Kardashians or whether it's about, you know, Warren Buffett in our case or, or, or anything. I mean, I think, I think, you know, this whole obsession with, uh, you know, traffic and clicks and headlines does not need to, 
it's not mutually exclusive with good journalism. And I think that's what people want. And so there's definitely an art to getting your story read and making sure it gets the attention it deserves. But that comes to the story conception, uh, the reporting, uh, the the writing and the headline. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's in a way it's great. It's a great thing for writers because there's a lot you have a lot more control over how you can get your work out there, you know, and it's not just about the headline. It's about tweeting about it or maybe making sure a couple people that, you know, have great followings, look at it. And if they like it and think it merits it, they can talk about it. And so that never used to happen. I mean, in the old days of, and I can say this because I've I've been in this industry (laughs) a long time, you know, we'd labor over print stories, put them to bed, be at the, be at work until three in the morning. And then it would come out a couple days later. And then it was just this kind of quiet zone. You know, Mm -hmm. you knew your work was out there, but, um, it, it was just, it was very, very different. You know, I was just thinking about that. And since you have such a pulse on what garners attention, it's really interesting to hear from your perspective, something that I have long wondered, I cannot figure it out for the life of me. But you mentioned, say, the uh, infatuation with something like the Kardashians, or um, I'm trying to think of other like crappy reality t- reality TV or whatever. So I I consider the there you go yeah I I consider <laughs> myself like the most average typical male in America and I cannot stand any of those shows or any of the just really anything in that genre for the most part I'm not trying to sound elitist or say hey those who do enjoy it are uh, somehow below me I I'm not at all I just want to know if you know why people like that why is that flourishing in the world you know i mean that goes back to the early days of reality television i guess with survivor you know wasn't that the first reality show i I think so or real uh, world maybe i don't know yeah the real world exactly it was this brand new groundbreaking format i mean who ever thought before then to follow regular people about their daily lives and sure you throw a conceit on it a contest of this that the other thing but it, it it just exploded and then it then it changed a little bit and now it's in the it, you know we're sort of in the celebrity phase with it and um i don't know i mean i don't watch the kardashians but uh and i mean that i will admit to watching the real housewives <laughs> but there's a sort of voyeurism about it mm. maybe or uh i mean the family is is kind of maybe inher- inherently interesting because of um the family being somewhat newsworthy and notable and to have all these daughters and all doing all these kind of things. And, um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I can't answer yeah, that. No, I was just interested in your opinion. And, and again, like I know I have guilty pleasures. I off the top of my head, I don't know what they are, but so to each his own, I was just wondering. But I think even before this phase, I mean, there's always been TV that some people would consider really high quality and some people would think is, is, is less so. And yeah. it just took a different format. And again, didn't get, didn't get marketed and blasted and promoted and shared and socialized so much. There wasn't as much chatter about anything. So mm-hmm. it's, 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 um, I don't know. It's interesting to think about. Well, so I want to switch gears a little bit and you mentioned this earlier, but you are the co-chair of the fortune, most powerful women's summit. And I, I would like to learn a little bit more about that in a certain context. And that is, as this podcast has evolved and grown, we're now almost at 200 interviews And I'd say starting about a couple months ago, we got a number of emails and it was people kindly mentioning that it's a very male dominated guest list. And that really shocked me. And looking back, I looked at it and I said, oh my gosh, like they're right. That's totally our fault. We didn't do a good enough job of representing both sexes. But when I look at it, unless there's a really subtle or subconscious bias going on, which I don't think there is. I just look for interesting people that I want to talk to. I don't care color, sex, race, you know, geographic location doesn't matter. When I looked back and we work with a lot of PR firms or, you know, agents and and all that stuff, I feel like they gave us a lot of male guests. Do you find that the female, you know, professional and is being underrepresented still in the world and hasn't made kind of the uh, visible leap the same way that men have for so long? 
Uh, yes. I mean, there's, there's a number of ways to answer that question. Number one is yes, men, uh, women are still not re- represented in the workplace at the same level and at the same, um, in particular seniority roles as men. And that's just a fact. I mean, that's exactly what Sheryl Sandberg wrote about with lean in. Right. Um, so they are underrepresented. Uh, but in the case you're describing, it's also that, um, you know, people are looking at the universe of what they know. And if you really want to make things even, you kind of have to try a little harder. And there's a lot of discussion about, oh, you don't want to ever have a situation where you have quotas, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the reasons why, for example, there aren't that many women in boardrooms it's changing a little bit, or there aren't that many people of diversity in boardrooms is because very often those kinds of roles, you know, it comes from when there's a spot open, it's like everybody turns to each other like, okay, who do you know? And a lot of people like Amory Slaughter and others have talked about this. And who you know is generally people like you. So you do have to try a little bit harder to open up the slates to people you don't know. And, and I mean that kind of you know, metaphorically, people from mm-hmm. different backgrounds, people of different genders, different ethnicities, the whole deal. And it takes a little bit more effort, but that's what's going to be required to, you know, to make our businesses and workplaces, you know, re- more representative of the general population. And, and the good thing is everybody seems to agree now that it's only good when you have a board. I keep talking about boards because that's where it's very, it's a very small group that's very powerful and it's, the numbers are kind of striking, but everybody is in agreement when you have a board that's much more equitable in terms of gender decisions. I mean, it's, you know, decisions are made in a, in a, in a better way. And, you know, it, this sounds like stereotyping, but a lot of people will say that women bring different things to the table. Um, they are, tend to be strong at consensus building and, uh, maybe have a slightly higher IQ. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to you know, just men or anything, but these things have been pretty much proven out. And so there's a much more of an effort right now to even things out at all levels. And you can see that everywhere. And I I think we're at a real turning point and a real pivot point. Fortune 500, for example, there were, there's, there's 20, what is the number? 20, 25 CEOs, women CEOs of the Fortune 500. And you could say that's terrible. That's barely 5%. That's just horrible. And that is, I mean, it it needs to be more, but not that long ago, the number was one. And that was in 1997, 98. And even then the one woman was half of a husband and wife couple that ran the company Golden West Financial. So the, the, the leaps and bounds we've made just in the past, um, you know, I would say decade are pretty striking. I mean, there were only four or five as recently as, um, you know, not that long ago. So there is momentum and certainly that's the CEO level at other levels of, um, of companies and of the workplace. It's, it's, it's dramatically different. Now we're going to take a quick minute to tell you about our sponsor this week, lynda.com. Lynda.com is the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash smart people. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash smart people. lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to master Excel, learn negotiation tactics, build a website, or boost your Photoshop skills Go to lynda.com and feed your curious mind. You've heard me mention it in the past, but there's some great courses on there that I'm a big fan of, such as Bootstrapping Your Business, Learning to Be Assertive, and Going Paperless, Start to Finish. And with a lynda.com membership, you can watch and learn from top experts, stream thousands of video courses on demand, browse each course transcript to follow along, and take notes as you go. Your lynda.com membership will give you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an industry expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, I'd like you to visit lynda.com slash smart people and sign up for your free special 10-day trial. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash smart people. Now back to the show. Yeah, we actually, episode 177, we interviewed a woman named Tiffany Lennon, and um, she she wrote a book called Recognizing Women's Leadership, and uh, in that, that was kind of when some when I was first 
when my eyes were just open to this only because I guess as a man, a white male, I never really thought of it. Like you said, you have to consciously step out of mm-hmm. who you are and who you surround yourself with. And yeah, she said in 2011, women ran 12 Fortune 500 companies. Mm-hmm. So when you right. think about that, that's a four times increase in the past four years or so. That's yeah. at least we're getting there, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I think that the, we're, we're really um, exponentially getting exponentially better with every passing year. And I think that will just continue. I mean, you've just seen women reach uh, new kind of firsts year after year, you know, whether it's, um, you know, it's a woman running for president, woman running the Fed. Uh, you know, there's many more examples. We're, we're seeing we're seeing women break through in a way that we haven't seen in a long time. Sure. Well, I want to move on here to talk about your book, which is fantastic, and we'll spend the the last portion of this interview doing that. Um, But prior to that, I just wanted to check on this because I love learning about people's stories, and especially, you know, you've made it to pretty much a pinnacle of an industry that is is hard, right? It's hard to get to where you are and and do all the things you're doing with the assistant managing editor at Fortune and the co-chair of Fortune Most Powerful Women. And you were the senior editor at Smart Money, another awesome publication. Could you give us just kind of a little brief background on how you got there and why you chose this path? Sure. I mean, I think like most people that get into journalism, um, it's kind of like a bug you get bitten by. And I got bitten by it really early in ninth grade when I took a journalism class. And I just thought, my God, this is the coolest thing ever. You get to learn about stuff and then tell people about it. And I just thought that was just so great. And it helped that my my mother was a reporter for our local newspaper, our, our really kind of small town paper. So she would write the profile of the week of kind of prominent members of our community. And I just thought that was really cool. And um, I don't know, I never really considered anything else. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that's a great thing. There might be other things I would have loved doing, but I just was kind of had tunnel vision that this is all I ever wanted to do. And um, I just, uh, from there, I, I didn't major in journalism or anything. I just knew when I got out of college that I wanted to pursue it. And so my first journalism job was at a magazine called Sporting Goods Business, which was the leading trade publication for the, the sporting goods retail industry. And so, you know, trade publications are this whole world of, uh, I mean, I interviewed at so many of them, and I, I always say that, like, of all the trade magazines, Sporting Goods Business was actually kind of cool because we got to go to all the trade shows, and I was writing about Nike and Reebok, and, you know, it was just a really fun industry to cover. Um, and I always say I could have worked at Wastebasket Weekly or, like, I mean, there's <laughs> a lot that I interviewed <laughs> that just were really obscure. But I, I think they're great places to get experience because you get to actually do the work. And so... I was hired to cover the the footwear business. I was the footwear reporter, but I didn't know anything about business. And when I say I didn't know anything, I I didn't know everybody was using. I would interview these companies, people from the companies, and they would use these. Everybody would use this one acronym, uh, IPO, and I had no idea what it meant. And I didn't want to ask, so I just kind of faked it. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and this is way before business was on the front page, and everybody knows. Right. You know, IPO wasn't in like the popular language the way it is now. But I mean, (laughs) I say that as an example, and I say this to young people a lot. It's like, you know, in journalism, you just have to really be um, curious and a a voracious learner or really want to learn about stuff because that's what the job is. So that's kind of how I got my start. And then from there, that job is what led to my interest in business and writing Mm -hmm. about business. I've never asked anybody this question, and I might start making it a, a standard on all of them because I love it. And I, don't, I don't know why it just came to me personally. <laughs> but question. Yeah, but I want to ask you, what is the best scary decision you've ever made? Oh, that's a really good question. That is a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Take You're your, take, journalism take your time. But <laughs> um, You know, I think it was a scare. I always thought I was going to be a writer forever. I, I, I was a writer at Forbes magazine and I just thought that was just like the best job in the world because you could really, um, it was a full-time job, but you spent all your time working on this story and then moving to the next story and then the next story and you could really delve into these topics and it was great. And then this opportunity to become an editor came up and, and the person who recommended me for this editor job at Smart Money, he was a sort of mentor of mine at, at Forbes and he called me in and he said, I recommended you for a job. You're not going to want to take it, but you really need to take it. (laughs) And uh, Uh, he was right. I didn't, I didn't necessarily see editing in my future. And so that was kind of scary. 
in the realm of scary moves, it's really not that scary. It's the same field and, and all that. But Well, no, I mean, that's the thing. It's nobody can define what scary, you know, scary is to each person. I mean, that's why I think that's interesting, right? Like everybody is going to have something and most people on the outside are going to go, oh, come on, that wasn't that big a deal. But <laughs> But at the moment, the decisions you make are the biggest things in your life, you know? That's true. That's very true. So, okay, I've, I've been waiting, and I can't wait any longer. I want to <laughs> talk about. I want to talk about your book, "The End of the Suburbs," and the full title is "The End of the Suburbs: Where the American Dream Is Moving." And I'm going to give you a minute to talk about more than the title because I'm going to be honest. Like that title uh, ruffled my feathers a little bit. I am a. I am a personal lover of the suburbs. I, I mean, and I'm going to, we'll talk about that, but okay. first give us a little more about what you mean by that. So people don't just hear the title and, and automatically think they know what it's about. Sure. Well, you know, it is a provocative title and that's by design and I wanted to ruffle feathers. So, um, I'm glad, uh, <laughs> but, uh, what it really means is it's sort of, it is the end of the suburbs as we know them. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, what drew me to this topic was I just started seeing this data that showed that increasingly, um, you know, the American suburbs were sort of the central pillar of our culture. It was the aspired uh, American dream for it was the default American dream that, you know, is such a part of our culture. There was this thinking that everyone should aspire to live this way. And um, there just is an increasing amount of proof that that it doesn't hold that central place in our culture that it once did. It doesn't mean that they're going to go away entirely. It means that certain types of suburbs are going to be really threatened, but it means that people are craving a different kind of existence and that this way of life that we have built and covered our landscape in uh, isn't the way that most people want to live anymore. So when you say that, the, you know, most people don't want to live, I guess, in a suburb, what does that mean? Because I come from a really interesting perspective here. I just moved out of not quite the heart of D.C. I mean, I was just outside of it, but literally two minutes to D.C. You could see the you know monument from my house, like all that stuff um, to the suburbs purposefully. And I love it. So I am confused. Am I just that off from what no, most people you're want? No, you're not off. You're not off. And also, I didn't come at this with a bias against the suburbs. I, I say in the book, I mean, I had a very wonderful child childhood growing up in a suburb outside of Philadelphia called sure. Media. Um, and I, I had this like Norman Rockwell existence. And uh, But that the kind of suburb I grew up in and that kind of existence doesn't – we kind of engineered a lot of the wonderful things about the old suburbs out of the suburbs. And what suburb are you in specifically? Um, it's Ashburn, Virginia. It's Loudoun County. So it's like okay. a really okay. fast growing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, um, you know, there just is increasingly a, a uh, craving for people to not be doing crazy commutes, which a lot of people in this country yes. did it ever more. So as we grew and grew and grew and the housing boom put people further and further and further away from their jobs, um, there's a craving to connect with people. And while in many suburbs that does happen in a lot of them, especially the more modern suburbs that were built on the kind of post 1950s model of kind of cul-de-sac connector road, arterial road, um, the kind of suburb that has looping subdivisions as opposed to small, smaller, narrower urban streets. That's a good way to kind of tell the new from the old. Uh, those, you know, really put people in their car all the time. And they, a lot of them tend to lack an even a town center or any kind of central gathering point. Um, so, you know, for example, you might have to get in your car and drive 20 minutes to get a gallon of milk if you need one at 1030 at night. And that's, mm. you know, that's a lifestyle that increasingly has failed to deliver on its promises. And um, so that's, that's really what I'm talking about. But I mean, the, the a big point I make in the book is that I'm not saying that everyone wants to rush and live into a skyscraper in Manhattan. I mean, I live in New York City. I don't think that's the answer for everybody either. And sometimes I wonder if it's the answer for me. Right. I, it's it's more that people want to live where there's a little bit of activity, a little bit of stuff going on. There's, you know, uh, maybe near a great coffee place that you can walk to. And that can happen in the suburbs just as much as it can happen in a large city or it can happen in a small city. So. Uh, just this notion that everyone must aspire to a, a, a four bedroom house with a lawn and a car and 2.5 kids. Uh, I mean, there's a whole demographic thing happening that's that's blowing up the the model as well. So it's just shifting. We had this one size fits all housing solution, and 
one size fits all doesn't work anymore. People want to kind of choose their own adventure and, and increasingly developers and builders and, um, are, are making that possible for them. No, that, that's a great point. And I heard in a previous interview you did, you mentioned this thing called urbanism everywhere. And, mm-hmm. and that may, that was an aha moment for me because the suburb quote unquote, I live in, I mean, the grocery stores, I don't know, a quarter mile away. Right. And there's a Starbucks and all that stuff there. Not saying it's, that's a great coffee shop, but everything's really close. We got a, a playground right behind us. There's a hiking trail. You know, it's great. And I live in a townhouse. It's not, you know, this, mm-hmm. but I have noticed in just the short time. I mean, I moved a month ago, like, in, even in a kind of affluent area, the restaurants aren't that great. Where coming from D.C., I mean, gosh, we were like, let's go get amazing tapas. And then we're going to go get something crazy. And I'm going to go get a $20 cocktail because I like those, you know. <laughs> and and that is lacking. So maybe that is a little bit. That's what I gathered from the urbanism everywhere. It's like you can have a little bit of the peace and quiet of a suburb, but with the accessibility of a city. Exactly. And and that's what, what people want. It's like they don't necessarily want to live in Manhattan, but they want a little bit of Manhattan sprinkled where they live. Yes, where is. exactly. And, and that's increasingly starting to happen. I mean, think about it. You live in a townhouse in the suburbs. The notion of a townhouse in the suburbs, it like it, it would have been anathema to the suburbs, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Oh. And now the multi the number of I mean, the multifamily construction in the suburbs is um, really strong. And there's all kinds of different options, even in the suburbs. There's a lot of kind of urban suburban building going on. And so that's designed precisely for that reason, to give people a kind of urban experience wherever they are. We'll be right back to this interview after a quick word from our sponsors. How many times have you had a meeting where you waste the first 15 minutes? Every meeting! I don't even think I can count that high. It's usually because someone has trouble joining the call or can't share your screen or someone else can't be heard or they don't have the right PIN code. All of those excuses we've all heard before. Nothing but problems. Well, the people at High Five want to give you back the first 15 minutes of every meeting. That's why they built easy-to-use video and web conferencing that you can actually love. Let's go over the problems with video and meetings today. Traditional video providers are ridiculously complicated and insanely expensive. You get charged expensive monthly service fees even when you don't really use their service. Not only that, but most of the time you get long pin codes that are hard to remember, there's cables everywhere, and time wasted. High Five can solve those problems for you. High Five is incredibly easy to set up and use. High Five is a seamlessly integrated hardware and cloud software solution that lets people work however they want. You can enjoy productive meetings in HD video with multiple people. With a simple click on your computer or swipe on your phone, move video calls from your personal device to the conference room TV. It's that easy. High Five is also affordable. High Five is only one twentieth the cost of traditional video providers. Outfit a conference room for only $799. That's a one-time fee. There's no maintenance fees or monthly overhead. It's yours to enjoy. What team doesn't want to high-five each other at work? Take back the first 15 minutes of every meeting and get started today. Go to highfive.com slash smart people and request a free trial of High Five. That's highfive.com slash smart people, H-I-G-H-F-I-V-E dot com forward slash smart people to request your free trial and start meeting face-to-face with High Five. And it's so funny, too, because people, I, I also heard you mention how strong of an opinion people have on this topic and because of the emotional ties. And for most people listening, right, like they grew up in a suburb. I mean, I could think of nothing better. And and you talk about it in your book, like you having grown up in a suburb as well. And what's funny is I this is where I grew up and now I have moved back here. My parents <laughs> live five minutes away. A lot of my friends have done the same and I just wonder if how much of it is kind of this yearning for the past and, you know, to go home and to feel that comfort or safety. I don't know. It's interesting. That's an interesting point. And it's funny that you mentioned that because one conversation I had, I don't even know if it made it into the I don't think it made it into the book. But I, I talked to one person who, who who grew up outside of Pittsburgh in a in an inner ring suburb and 
he had these nostalgic memories of childhood where literally there were all these kids on the block and everybody, like you didn't know whose house you were going to sleep in at night. Like <laughs> everybody went to somebody else's house. The doors were open. Nobody asked permission. The kids were just running around everywhere. And it was like a communal, you know, it was almost like a commune because the neighbors were so tight and everybody knew that everybody had everybody's back. Mm -hmm. And he moved to a really great, kind of small townish suburb outside of New York City. It's a very desirable suburb and uh, very urban as well. And he, he said he felt like he was really desperately trying to recreate that. And there are neighbors right nearby, but nobody talks to each other. Yes. Everybody's dual parent working, you know, families. And so nobody's home and there, everything is scheduled by play date. And there isn't that organic um, running around and bumping into each other. It doesn't happen. And so um, that's not all because of city versus suburb. That's, I think, how our lifestyle has changed. But a lot of people tried to uh, go recreate the suburbs they knew they grew up in and they had a wonderful experience in and failed to do so for a number of different reasons. So, I mean, I talked to one woman who thought she was buying into the American dream. She had four kids. She and her husband moved to a suburb outside of Boston. And um, she was struck by the fact that, you know, everybody had a play swing set in their backyard, but you couldn't have access to that swing set. You had to make a date to go and, you know, it, it wasn't what she thought it was going to be. And, um, I mean, I heard stories like this over and over. I heard a woman who said she lived in a beautiful suburb, uh, outside of Chicago, three story foyer, circular driveway and everything. And she said after 10 years of living there, she realized she had never set foot in any of her neighbor's kitchens. And that wasn't what she thought she was getting when she moved to the suburbs. And so people are trying to recreate this, but it's not, working in many cases, not all cases, but it's, it's, there's, it's not fulfilling on the, 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 the promise. You no, know, And I'd actually love to hear, especially with your research, why that specifically is happening. Like we want that connectivity, but it doesn't happen because I, I totally agree with what you were saying. Like when I grew up, it was okay. Go outside from literally sunrise to sunset. I mean, I would do stupid stuff, shoot BB guns, like climb trees, get hurt, whatever. Um, but as long as I came home for dinner, all is well. And who knows? Yeah, I knew all my neighbors as a kid. Mm -hmm. And now everything is structured. I, I look at, I, I don't have, I mean, I only have a, a baby right now. So when he grows up, I'll understand this. But I look at neighbors and cousins and it's like, okay, we take them to this practice and then this one and then this competition. And I realize it's because that's the only way they're really, truly going to interact. You have to schedule it now. What happened? I think it's um, largely because of uh, families where both parents work. Um, but I think part of it is also that we, I mean, part of it relates to the design of the suburbs. And I spend a lot of time talking about that in the book. I mean, the, the suburbs, I mentioned the suburbs in the movie Silver Lining Playbook, which happens to have been filmed where I, near where I grew up. But there are these narrow streets, very urban kind of suburbs. And it, the design of a community really shapes how people interact in it. And when we sort of blew that model up and started designing the more modern kind, the kind of cul-de-sac cul plus strip mall plus highway interchange model, you know, things got further and further apart. So houses are further apart. Again, the lack of town centers. There's no, there's nothing bringing people together. Now, many communities like that might have a strong, there might be a tight community because the parents all get together or because they like to do stuff together. But in a lot of places, that doesn't happen. So that's part of it. And then I, I also think the commute has people in their cars so much. And it's funny because a, a big reason people move to the suburbs is for the children to prioritize having a lawn and having space for the kids and better schools. Um, but when the parents are spending so much time going to and from that house, it's actually, it can, without planning on it, it can become deprioritizing mm -hmm. the family. And so there's a lot of that happening. Um, and then another thing happening is that there's the, the, the demographics in this country are changing. I mean, the uh, parents with children household used to be the majority and it's no longer, it's a minority and uh, builders and developers are really planning for that. So it's really a number of reasons. Well, let's talk about the commute because all I have to say is what the hell, like what is <laughs> happening? I mean, the commute alone has made twice made the decision on what my career is was going to be. Wow. Yeah. And because I just, I gave up because, you know, it's so interesting to see it again around here. I swear DC, I think was ranked one of the worst traffic in the, in the country. I mean, more yeah. so than 
I want to say even L.A., which was which was surprising. But mm-hmm. I I lived three miles from you know as the I, not even as the crow flies three miles by car from my job, and it took me um, forty five minutes one way. Oh my gosh! So you could walk much faster, like or or especially ride a bike, you know. Yeah. Um, and I did that when it was warm out, like. What is happening? Was this always the case? Because I don't know. It's all I've ever known. But why not just have these companies, you know, take up shop in the suburbs themselves? I don't get it. Well, that did happen, actually. I mean, part of the pa- the, the path that everybody beat to the suburbs in the 70s and 80s included companies, included companies setting up headquarters. That's why we have a lot of suburban office parks. It's a, it's a kind of a big fixture of modern day suburbia. Um, increasingly companies are moving, pulling up those stakes and moving back into cities. And there's a number of examples about that, but that's, uh, kind of another story, but the, the commutes got worse and worse and worse because, you know, all the growth was happening in the suburbs. And so people had to go further and further away. And especially during the housing boom and then bust, I mean, people were going really far away to chase the American dream really far. There was this drive to qualify phenomenon where the cheapest houses were the further away and everybody wanted a piece of that dream. So, um, that there you're just talking a distance commute. I mean, you have three and a half million people in this country now do what are called super commutes. They're 90 minutes or more each way each day. And a large reason that's happening is just because of the sheer distance people were moving. But you mentioned the traffic, and that's another that's another huge problem because that you know with more growth and population in the suburbs, it, it congests the roads. And Atlanta is a is a real uh, traffic is a real problem. Um, I spoke to a woman from the Inland Empire of California, which is another area of vast expansion. It's San River, uh, San Bernardino and Riverside counties east of Los Angeles. And this woman I talked to had to get up at 3.50 in the morning and get in her car at 4 o'clock to, because only at that hour, only at that minute, was she guaranteed that the ride would only take an hour and 15 minutes. And she lived in, it was literally, it was called a commuter town of uh, Los Angeles, and it was 62 miles away. And she would get there, she would drive, but then get get to her classroom. She was a teacher at 5.15 in the morning. And what do you do when you get to work at 5.15 in the morning? She would go back to sleep <laughs> under her desk. She had a mattress and a blanket and everything until she had to get up and get ready for the day to start. You know, the thing you mentioned about the costs and the, the home value, that is so key. I mean, just having seen my friends who still rent, say, in Arlington, just outside of D.C., pay mm-hmm. pay twice as much as my mortgage 40 minutes away, right? And mm-hmm. it's just the cost differential is crazy. And it's almost leaving people with no alternatives, though, because well, if you have kids, I mean, you can't live unless you make a lot of money. You can't live in the city. You can't live necessarily close to it. You're going to have to commute. I don't know. What solution did you find? Well, that's interesting because, yes, it's true that um, that price differential is prohibitive for a lot of people. But one thing that people do not factor into that math equation is the cost of their commute and the cost of their transportation. And that's gas, but it's also maintenance of a car parking it's also it's all sorts of things and and when you factor all that in especially when gas prices were higher a lot of research has been done um there's a great enterprise out of uh chicago called the center for neighborhood technologies and they found that in in some of the most kind of drive to qualify ish suburbs people were spending more of their income more of their monthly income on transportation than on housing because the mortgage was cheap and the cost of commuting was so expensive. So there's a part of that math equation that's not, that's not thought about that needs to be thought about. And in fact, there's been an effort to try to um, make mortgages reflect this like location efficient mortgages. They're called where, you know, you might get a better rate and a better deal, better terms if you if your house is located in a place that makes the commute less taxing economically. Hmm. And so you get rewarded for that decision rather than as it is now um, where you're not. So th- that, that equation isn't as as black and white as it seems. Yeah, no, that that's also a good point. It's one of those hidden costs that I mean, I do think about it every time I get in the car and have to fill up. It's really annoying. I guess you just have to figure out where your priorities lie and then go with that and make it work. I mean, for me and for my wife, it was like, well, we now have jobs that allow us to not have to commute 
either at all or that far. So we can almost live wherever. But that was by design. I mean, I said five years ago, I said, I'm never driving into a city again for a commute (laughs) every day. I'm not doing it. Right. You had almost like PTSD. I honestly did. Yes. But but the other thing is, the other thing you, you could do, the other option for people out there is to just live near some sort of robust public transit, which does not exist in all parts of the country. But Mm. that can be a real game changer as well. I mean, even if you're doing a suburban to city commute uh, here in New York, for example, there's there's a very robust public transit system. Most people who live in the suburbs take some kind of public transit, whether it's a bus or a train to get into the city. And um, that's incredibly liberating. And, you know, not only the from the economic equation, but also you've got time that time it it frees you up i mean you can do anything on the train you can read you can get work done you can you know do calls and annoy everybody in the car uh it's just it's it's very liberating and more and more people don't want to be behind the wheel and we're especially seeing that with millennials so very true yeah well well, i know you got you have to get going we've only kind of uh touched the surface of this book but it's great because now people will go out and read it i really (laughs) recommend it and especially because it, it is such an emotionally charged subject you do a great job of what i love is you presented the facts it wasn't this argument for or against it was hey here's what's going on here's the research and so we will link to it as always we do on our site again the book is the end of the suburbs where the american dream is moving okay well i'm gonna let you go thank you again so much is there anywhere that uh, our guests can find you i know you know you write you do all this stuff where's the best place uh, let's see. You can find me. I have a website, uh, endofthesuburbs.com, and you can also um, find uh, my work and the work of my great colleagues on fortune.com, and uh, you can watch my show. I guess I have to start saying yes, that. Yes, you do. Uh, How do we to, find that? Fortune Live. It's every Friday from 3 to 3.30, but it lives permanently on the internet, so you can go to fortune.com backslash fortune live and watch a lot of a lot of uh, past episodes. And we'll be sure to link to that. I actually want to go check it out. I haven't yet, but I'm excited. Now I have something to kill the rest of my day. Thanks this so much, great. Chris. Well, we, <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, great stuff. And um, congratulations on all your success. Try to try to take a little time off when you can. I, I plan to do that. <laughs> I plan to do that. But thank you for your interest. And it's Absolutely. been a whole lot of fun talking to you. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. All righty. Bye-bye. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Lee Gallagher. Please remember you can find her book, The End of the Suburbs, Where the American Dream is Moving, on Amazon or at your local bookstore. And if you do decide to purchase it on Amazon, don't forget to use the Smart People Podcast Amazon link over at smartpeoplepodcast.com. You just click the Amazon banner at the top of the page, do your shopping like you normally would on Amazon, And we get a nice little kickback from Amazon at no cost to you. You can also use the convenient link, smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. If you'd like to reach out to the show, you can shoot us an email at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or send us a message on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. That's it for this week. Don't forget to check out our sponsors, Aspiration, High Five, and Linda. Without them, the show really wouldn't be that possible, so please check them out, and we thank them for being supportive of Smart People Podcast. Stay tuned for more great interviews coming up, and we will see you guys next week. Again, we'd like to thank our sponsor, High Five. High Five is a seamlessly integrated hardware and cloud software solution that is incredibly easy to set up and use. Enjoy productive meetings and HD video face-to-face with multiple people however you need to, in a conference room on the TV, from your phone, tablet, or computer, wherever you are. Hi5 is only 5% of the cost of traditional video providers, and there's no maintenance fees or monthly overhead. Once you buy it, it's yours to enjoy. What team doesn't want to high-five each other at work? Take back the first 15 minutes of every meeting and get started today. Go to highfive.com slash smart people and request a free trial of High Five. That's H I G H F I V E dot com forward slash smart people to request your free trial and start meeting face to face with High Five.